So welcome all of you to the 22nd live webinar on orthopedic principles. We have Dr. Rajiv Lamaya once again with us. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon in the UK with specialization in foot. I welcome Dr. Rajiv Lamaya once again to the 22nd live webinar on orthopedic principles. Over to you, Prof. You can share your screen. Thank, thank you, Hitesh. Thank you. Um, so welcome, welcome all again. Uh, this time we are going to talk about the chronic ligament injuries um, around the ankle. And this will be covering both medial and lateral side of the ankle. So as we all know, this is one of the most common conditions affecting the ankle joint. Soft tissues um, uh, damage, soft tissue injuries um, is one of the common presentation into the a &E, as well as into any orthopedic surgeon's practice. It affects all age group patients, it can be seen as acute or chronic condition. It leads to loss of recreational activities with pain and dysfunction subsequently. So why do we need to understand this condition? For two reasons from this uh, seminar point of view. One is that it's a common discussion uh, during the aphasis ortho exams because one can get a short case, one can get a discussion on the adult pathology or trauma section, and it is one of the condition patients have not uh, patients haven't got much pain initially, and hence they can they are happy to come to the exams. In addition to that, this is a common condition that we see in our own, own clinical practice as well. So in order to know a little bit more about it, one has to revisit the anatomy again. The ankle anatomy is complex. It's made by tibia, fibula, and talus with supporting ligaments all around the ankle, both medially, laterally, superiorly, and inferiorly supported by the calcaneus uh, and the talus. There are ligaments on medial and lateral side of the ankle, Laterally, there are three important ligaments, which are anterior talofibular ligament, also known as ATFL, posterior talofibular ligament, which is the PTFL, and CFL, which is the calcaneofibular ligament. On the medial side, there is a deltoid ligament, which is uh, split into superficial and deep deltoid. The stabilizers of the ankle are classified as static and dynamic. The static stabilizers include shape of the bone or the shape of the, uh, the ankle joint. The ATFL supports the ankle uh, to prevent excessive virus deformity. So if there's excessive virus strain pro provided, the ATFL is stretched and ruptured. If there is also uh, translation anterior, anterior posteriorly, the ATFL and PTFL support the ankle joint. The CFL is damaged when there is tilt and internal rotation, as well as the virus stress to the joint. The dynamic uh, stabilizers include muscles around the ankle. So in combination of muscles, uh, ligaments, and the shape of the bone, ankle joint becomes very stable joint indeed. And hence, it's very uncommon to dislocate this joint that easily without damaging the ligaments or the bones. So fracture dislocations are something that we see, but in order to get that, one has to damage the static and dynamic stabilizers. So what's the biomechanics of the injury? As you can see in this little picture here on, on the bottom screen, you can see the inversion and internal rotation can lead to ATFL rupture, followed by PTFL rupture. If there is extreme external rotation that leads to damage to the deltoid ligaments and syndesmosis, eventually getting the so-called high ankle sprain. If there is forced dorsiflexion, then that leads to PTFL rupture it also leads to damage to the posterior structures as well as the plafond fracture of the distal tibia. 
as we all know, it accounts for about 10 to 10 to 40% um, of the an ankle athletic injuries, depending on the various re reports that are published. However, the lateral side injuries account for about 80% of these ankle sprains, and there's only about 20% affections on the medial side. About 10 to 30% of these acute sprains will lead into somewhat um, chronic nature problem, which is the chronic symptomatology leading to instability. So what's the path pathogenesis? Either it starts as an acute or chronic repetitive stress. The acute injury can, uh, can heal in about 70 to 80% of the patients with gradual return to normality, but in some patients, it leads to elongation of the ligament. It leads to alteration of the mechanical properties and leads to recurrent injuries. As you can see that if there is a recurrent injury that leads to repetitive damage to the ligaments again. So one has to understand the difference between instability and laxity. As we know, laxity when it becomes symptomatic can form into instability but it is described in two different modes. And the first one is functional instability. And the second one is mechanical instability. To understand this clearly, functional is subjective complaint of the patient. So when patients come into clinic, they say, my ankle gives way on me, or my ankle feels loose, or I cannot trust this ankle. These are the functional instability symptoms. When the doctor examines that ankle and finds the mechanical instability that is an objective evidence performed by special tests, which we'll come to in a minute. So in the acute setting, the patient evaluation is very important. Uh, we need to take the history of the uh, injury, mechanism of the injury, if there was any previous injury, could they mobilize uh, after the previous injury? Where's the pain? Where's the swelling? And then also take into consideration other symptoms and comorbidities. As with any joint, one starts with examination. And if you keep the, keep the examination protocol as look, feel, move special test, then it's very difficult to forget about the, uh, the assessment criteria then. So in examination, one looks for swelling, bruising. Um, obviously, if there is dislocation, there is deformity, and also patient is unable to walk and stand. If uh, the patient um, is able to stand and walk, uh, it is unlikely that, the, the, that they have broken the bones, but it can still happen. Hence, examination by feel is also important. Palpation of the bones, ligaments, medially and laterally, tendons, as well as the neurovascular structures need to be assessed. As you can see, the specific points of tenderness is where the ligaments are, and you need to know where the ligaments generally lie according to this little figure here, and then one can examine these specific ligaments. When we move the joint, we have to do plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, and eversion, but they can be quite painful in the acute settings, hence may not be reliable. Going on to special tests, some of these tests are possible in the acute setting, some are not. Hence, one has to um, go with the caution. The anterior draw test is one of the most important signs that we do for the integrity of the ATFL. Taylor tilt test is done for integrity of the CFL and the squeeze test for syndesmotic injuries. So the anterior draw test is performed as follows, and this, can, this is a very reliable test in the chronic instability, but can also be seen in the anterior acute setting. So essentially the patient's leg is um, uh, like this, and the doctor holds the distal tibia and holds the calcaneus, and the foot is pulled forward. If there is abnormal motion in this region here with a formation of a little dimple or a positive suction sign, then it indicates that the anterior talofibular ligament is deficient. 
moving on to the inversion stress test is done as follows. When there is inversion stress given to the foot, and if there is increased opening on the lateral side, then this is a positive inversion stress test. We have to compare this with the opposite side because sometimes if patients are with hyperlaxity syndrome, then you may get false positive tests. Hence, at times, and this is important from the examination perspective again, is one has to do the modified Baton scoring. And the modified Baton scoring says that if there are seven points out of nine, then it becomes significant for hyperlaxity syndrome. The third important test is the squeeze test. As you can see, if one squeezes the calf and the pain is down into the syndesmotic region, then it generally indicates the syndesmos syndesmotic tear. However, the external rotation test is also an important test for instability of the syndesmosis. And this is done by patients sitting on the edge of the couch and the foot forcibly externally rotated like this, giving thereby pain in the syndesmotic area down here. After the clinical examination, we do imaging uh, to confirm the diagnosis. And this is done by plain x-rays. If they are able to weight bear, then ideally weight bearing x-rays are essential. If not, non-weight bearing x-rays are fine. The MRI scan is done to rule out other injuries such as the osteochondral damage, deep deltoid ligaments, uh, damage to the bone such as microtrabecular injury, or ultrasound can be done to see soft tissues around the tendon, around the ankle such as tendon tears, synovitis, soft tissue injury, but more so in a chronic uh, situation. The stress tests are done either in the clinic setting uh, if the patient is not in so much of pain. But generally my experience is in the acute setting, this is very painful and hence it is not done routinely. It can be done as an adjunct to arthroscopy before we do any surgical intervention. It also can be done in a chronic setting uh, and this can be done in the clinic very easily. It may require sedation, it may require a hematoma block in the acute setting, but it's important to examine the contralateral ankle as well to compare the findings. So generally clinical grading is type stage one, stage two and stage three, as you can see here. And then depending on the staging, the treatment is instituted. However, generally in acute setting, the treatment is conservative. In acute setting, we give something like this, which is called air cast boot or a moon boot, which can give support to the ankle, rest, ice, elevation, compression, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, anti protection from further injuries. You can ask them to functionally weight bear with the boot on and then we can start early range of motion exercises in the early phase, which lasts for about three to seven days. Physiotherapy plays a significant role in the early stages, especially with peroneal tendon strengthening, coordination, proprioception, and gastrosoleal stretching. Usually we require the boot to be kept uh, for about four to six weeks but then patients take it off a few times in a daytime, exercises, physiotherapy, and then puts the boot back on again for mobilization. Usually we take the patients uh, out of boot at nighttime, especially when they're not weight bearing, it is allowed to walk without, um, uh, without the boot. Wobble board training comes later in the, uh, in the weeks, and this is an important test that is done for proprioception. Patients go on the wobble board to see if they're able to, con uh, to manage their uh, lateral ligament injury. And this is for functional uh, rehabilitation of these patients. Usually we, we advise them to return to sports after the initial six weeks to eight weeks uh, resting and bracing they usually start in a closed gym setting uh, with return to sports 
at approximately three months. Again, it depends on what type of sports they want to go back to. If they are in a very competitive sports, then generally we have to uh, return them into sports with caution. What happens if they fail to respond? They may be very well treated with acute treatment, but they may continue to have problems. So is it best to give them permanent orthosis or is it best to avoid sports or to continue with physiotherapy all along? These are difficult questions to discuss. Some patients are non-competitive uh, uh, sports men and women, and they don't mind having an orthosis, avoidance of sports or change of sports or ongoing physiotherapy a bit longer. But some patients who are essentially uh, competitive sports or um, uh, professional sports men and women, they would want to go back to early sports. And for those patients, surgery to reconstruct is the best way forward. How long can we wait before we consider surgery? This is an important question that is discussed both by the patients and in the exam setting. Generally, we say that up to six months of rehabilitation is essential. If somebody does not respond well to conservative management by six months, it is very reasonable to reconstruct their ligaments later on. As we know from the early discussion, 30 to 40% of these patients will actually go into um, chronic injuries who will require some form of surgical reconstruction. So the surgery is divided into two main groups. One is open surgery. The other one is arthroscopically assisted surgery. And their repair techniques are classified as anatomical repair or reconstruction or non-anatomical repair or reconstruction. I'll come to the difference in a minute, but we also have uh, recently used the interest in allograft or artificial ligaments, or even augmentation devices. The role of arthroscopy is very important. This is an important paper that came out a few years ago by Kibler, who found that about 80% of the ankles, if are arthroscoped prior to performing uh, a procedure to reconstruct their ligaments, they had found some intra-articular pathology. Now, there are varying reports of uh, use of role of arthroscopy, and they are obviously to find out other problems associated. They include loose bodies, uh, uh, osteochondral lesions, damage to the, um, uh, the ligaments leading to, uh, to other uh, impaction fractures, et cetera. And this can be seen by an arthroscopy done prior to surgery. The ankle arthroscopy, I will talk about it uh, in, a, in a brief manner to show you how the patient is set up and how the portals are used. And then we go on to the procedures of the ankle reconstruction themselves. So it's again important to revisit the anatomy if you're learning the ankle arthroscopy. There are important nerves which come on the anterolateral side, anteromedial side, as well as on the posterior side of the ankle where our portals are going to be. So the, the tendons to, to note on the anterior side are the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum here into the front of the ankle where the, the peroneal nerve is and the main neurovascular uh, lies right in the midline here. So although the ankle arthroscopy portals, the, work, the workhorse portals are anteromedial portal, which is medial to the tibialis anterior tendon and the anterolateral portal, which is in between the superficial branch of peroneal or the intermediate branch of the superficial peroneal nerve. These two are the workhorse uh, of the anterior portals. There is also an anterocentral portal, which is very close to the neurovascular but in the posterior side, if one has to do microfracture of the posterior dome of the talus, or if there is a loose body in the back of the ankle joint, one has to go posterolateral or posteromedial of the ankle 
bearing in mind on the medial side, there is neurovascular structure. On the lateral side, there is sural nerve as well as the small saphenous vein. So like, for example, like I mentioned, the anterior portals are used commonly here. But important things to look out for is superficial branch of peroneal nerve and the saphenous nerve and vein on the anterior, anterior portals. For the posterior portals, one has to look for the nerves as we discussed earlier on. So surgically, prior to doing the arthroscopy, we find out where the superficial peroneal nerve is and the branches are. So we invert the foot to see where the nerve is running. And you can see in most of the patients, you can see the actual course of the nerve. And then it is generally seen from the tip of the fibula, if you put four fingers above the tip of the fibula, the nerve comes out there and then goes down along the line here. So you can most of the times visualize the nerve and stay out of that nerve. Having said that, sometimes even by stretching that little uh, branch of the nerve, patient can get tingling in the, in the lateral border of the foot for a few weeks to come. Sometimes they uh, get that um, resolved very quickly. Sometimes they take a long time to recover. Majority of the times this injury is just a neuropraxia or stretching of the nerve rather than cutting the nerve unless somebody is too close to the nerve. So the patient is set up in this position. The patient is lying pro, uh, supine in this position here. The head end is on this side. The foot end is here. We use the furcal distractor and it is all sterile equipment that can be applied after painting and draping. And one can increase the traction on the ankle uh, with this little distractor technique. On this side, I don't know if you can see there's a that there is an arthroscopy pump, which we have to use with pressure of about 30 to 40 millimeters. The nerve is located here. As I mentioned, the main neurovascular structures on the front of the ankle and the tibialis anterior is marked on the front here. We will either go anterior to the nerve or the posterior to the nerve, according to where we want to go in terms of the incision. And then generally the arthroscope is used from the anteromedial portal and the insertion of the instrument can be done through a lateral portal or through the posterior portal if it's necessary. And then the arthroscopy is done um, as a prior procedure before we open up the ankle joint. The arthroscopic findings as we know uh, as I mentioned in the normal ankle, you would see the ATFL coming up like that. This is the antero inferior tibiofibular ligament, and this is the medial side deltoid ligament. Now, majority of the times when we are doing the lateral reconstruction of the ankle in a chronic setting, this lateral ligament is not visualized. And many a times this ligament is quite thickened, giving the impingement on the antero lateral part of the ankle thereby causing pain. You will also see a lot of synovitis as seen in these other pictures, and there may be also loose bodies that are seen. So if there's a loose body like that, one has to remove it. The micro fracture is done in this area like this, and then the rest of the bony spurs are shaved down. Once this procedure is done, then we go down the route of either anatomical or non-anatomical reconstruction, as we uh, mentioned earlier on. However, the commonest workhorse is the direct repair or anatomic reconstruction of the ankle. This is used by using Brostrom Gore technique. And the initial description was done in 1966, but was modified later on by another chap called Gould which now is now called as prostrum gold repair. And it is done by not only by repairing the end-to-end -end rupture of the ligaments, but it also pulls the extensor retinaculum back onto the anterior part of the fibula like this to reinforce the repair that you're, that you're doing. In addition to that, sometimes the augmentation of the syndesmosis is done by putting um, uh, things such as the tightrope uh, suture anchor. This is by far the most successful operation 
in the ankle ligament instability. And as you can see, about 80 to 90% of the patients are effectively treated by this method. This is the same picture again, showing the repair of the ATFL and CFL, but this side shows the Gould modification by which pulling the inferior extensor retinaculum back onto the fibula. We can use the anchors put into the fibula now to use to reconstruct these two ligaments. Alternatively, one can make drill holes into the fibula and then pull the sutures into the ligaments and repair back onto the fibula. In the recent advances, unfortunately, this video might not play, but the internal brace has come into uh, a lot of function. The internal brace is essentially a tightrope like structure, which is associated with a fiber tape. And this is uh, inserted into the lateral part of the fibula, as well as into the neck of the talus, where the ligament is attached as an augmentation device. And this is not to replace the modified Brostrom Gold, but used as a conjunction method or augmentation method in addition to Brostrom Gold technique. We have recently completed our 68 patient study of the internal brace and uh, the publication will be out fairly shortly showing 90% success rate and 80% return to sports after six months of the initial injury. Sorry, after the repair. There are some additional procedures that may be necessary and they, they, they include microfracture, like I mentioned earlier on. There could be removal of loose bodies or lately we have been using the technique called amic technique, which is the autogenous uh, matrix induced chondrogenesis technique, which is a very effective technique that is used using something called a chondro guide or this is a patch that is used to cover the cartilage defects made from xenografts. So the pig chondrocytes are used and they are prepared um, as a sheet of active chondrocytes and they can be implanted onto the defects. And the defect is then healing up back into a better quality fibrocartilage rather than white fibrocartilage. As we know, most of the times the return to highline cartilage is extremely difficult. However, with the amic technique, we have shown in our 25 cases that one year down the line, the loss of cartilage that was seen initially has now been uh, filled up with new bone as well as new cartilage. Perhaps I can take uh, another lecture on that at a later point. Postoperatively, this is how we, we see that the Brostrom Gold is done like this by using the anchors. Sometimes we had to do a calcaneal uh, corrective osteotomy if there is a deformity of the bone and then the tightrope sutures commonly used for uh, syndesmotic repair or um, screws can be used there as well. This is a common technique that we use for syndesmotic um, malunions or uh, instabilities uh, in association with the fractures sometimes. And this is a simple suture button which prevents the uh, absolute stability, but allows the natural stability as well as some movement in the syndesmotic area, thereby giving a better outcome in the longer run. Again, syndesmotic reconstruction, unfortunately this video may not play, but this is again tested intraoperatively. Now this particular case is with the fracture, but in a case where we are doing ligament reconstruction, we would still do the same procedure or we might have us assess the level of the syndesmotic area using the arthroscopic technique by putting a probe into that region and rotation of the probe, obviously seeing the abnormal motion between the tibia and fibula. Going on to the non-anatomic procedures for completion, um, these are the techniques they were used prior to the Brostrom Gold technique. Uh, the use of peroneus brevis, uh, tendon, uh, use of FDL, FHL, uh, many other uh, tendons were considered, but 
most of the times uh, they lead to a lot of problems such as stiffness, subtalar restriction, uh, subjective ongoing pain and instability, and obviously osteoarthritis in the subtalar joint. The only uh, procedure that can be given uh, some benefit um, in a non-anatomic situation where the anatomic uh, procedures have failed several times is Chrisman Snook procedure, where we use the split peroneus brevis graft. The split peroneus brevis is used to reconstruct these ligaments on the lateral side, as you can see here, which prevents the anterior translation at the cost of restriction of the subtalar joint motion, leading to osteoarthritis affecting subtalar joint. So these are the uh, disadvantages of non-anatomic repair and they are demanding procedures, hence they are not commonly used and not um, usually required. Moving on to the deltoid ligament, uh, usually deltoid ligament in isolation is very uncommonly seen, although it is seen in conjunction with the so-called high ankle sprain, where you get a Weber C fracture and also significant talus subluxation laterally. So it is seen as a form of the eversion injury. It is associated with medial pain. And also this is seen in patients with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction sometimes in association with a flat foot deformity. It is more than likely associated with the syndesmotic injury. So in an acute setting, if we are uh, seeing something like that, then the, the technique nowadays is to fix the fibula fracture, retain the length of the fibula, reduce that talus back into the joint, and then possibly repair the medial side using some anchors if required. If the patient is not tender on the medial side, which is highly unlikely, there is also a view of leaving the medial side well alone to let it heal naturally but then some of these patients do develop medial sided pain, and this is more than likely due to um, inadequate healing of the deep deltoid. And sometimes one has to go back through, a, through an arthroscopic method again and debride, the te debride this uh, torn deep deltoid and reconstruct at a later point. So what happens if we leave this condition untreated? There is a chance that these patients will develop not only chronic pain and osteoarthritis, but effectively they can lead to deformity uh, around the ankle. In syndesmotic, sometimes a bone block fusion such as this might be necessary. And in certain cases where there's chronic deformities of medial sided ligament injury, the ankle can go into valgus deformity like that. And if there is more deformity of varus, then that could be a reflection of the lateral side injury not healed properly, leading to lateral compartment uh, opening up. Tibia remains the same, talus goes into varus deformity, and the patient ends up with this typical deformity, which requires a supramalleolar osteotomy and reconstruction of the ligaments at a later point. So the take home message for this um, condition is that it is a very common problem. It needs to be looked with high index of suspicion, especially in a chronic setting. With recent imaging, recent diagnostic uh, modalities, we can find out the exact problems. The clinical outcomes are very predictable. And also for those who are listening who are FRCS or candidates, this can be a common uh, case in your exam. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lemay, for that brilliant presentation once again. I think everyone is very happy listening to you. So you. a couple of questions. Uh, uh, when you mean instability on the lateral side, uh, it could be either the anterior talofibular ligament or the syndesmotic, right? Correct. Can you have a combined situation? Yes, that's a good question. We see quite often when patients present with lateral instability, 
they will also have some pain higher up in the ankle. So when you're examining the ankle, uh, as you um, test the ATFL, where the pain is on the anterolateral side of the ankle, you can also do um, tenderness testing on the syndesmotic area. So my experience is about 20% of all the lateral ligament injuries where there is a proven torn ATFL or CFL, you will get syndesmotic tear as well. Now we are coming up with a paper recently where we have compared the MRI scans of about 70 patients. And those are the 70 patients who have gone on to have arthroscopy and reconstruction and we have correlated the findings between the MRI scan and the arthroscopic findings. And we found that the MRI scan is actually less pr predictable in that sense when it comes to syndesmotic injuries. Because as you know, there is anterior syndesmosis and posterior syndesmosis and something in between. And as we know, the anterior is, anterior is damaged very, very quickly and very commonly. The posterior is quite stable. But when you put a probe into that joint and rotate that probe, and if there is some motion in the tibia and fibula, it is very common that that syndesmosis is deficient. And hence we end up treating that at the same time. So it is better to be prepared for both. Yes. In case you're going for surgery, right? Yes. Because my... you cannot say, because most intraop. Yes. And my experience is that I think there is more damaged syndesmosis that you will see with an arthroscopy rather than MRI scan. And that's okay, just so my you, opinion. You mean to say you'll be able to visualize the syndesmosis? Yes. So visualization of the syndesmosis is good with the arthroscopy. You can see where the anterior um, syndesmosis is, where the posterior is where the synovitis is, sometimes you see impingement of the syndesmosis with a large bulge of synovium floating inside the joint. And once you debride that part of the syndesmosis, and if you put a probe in, it just goes in completely. And that just generally tells you that there is a complete rupture of the syndesmosis. And maybe you can do a, a hook test, like what you said, simultaneously. Is it possible yeah. to do a hook while doing an arthroscopy? Well, the hook will not be from the outside of the ankle, like we normally do in a fracture stabil stabil stability testing, but it will be from internal examination. So in other words, your probe is internally rotating between the tibia and fibula to see if there is any abnormal motion. Mm -hmm. Again, the hook test, as we know, is not a very re reliable test either. That has some false negative, there are some false positive, uh, and I think direct visualization is better in the understanding of the syndesmotic injuries. And that's the area where there is a chronic pain, generally lasting even after the modified brostrum gold is done. Okay, so that's a very valid point that we need to address both pathologies simultaneously if it is there, right? Correct, absolutely and, correct. And the other one is, uh, what is the role for uh, proprioceptive training and uh, wobble board exercises for chronic yeah. instability? So essentially, again, this is going back to the non-operative management. Now, non-operative management means that these patients need to know where their foot or ankle is in spatial time and frame. So in other words, if they can't put their foot and ankle in the right position, then they know that they might just buckle that ankle again. So what we ask them to do is we ask them to close their eyes and stand on one foot, the affected foot, and see how stable they are. And if they're able to maintain that stability standing, then that just means that their proprioception uh, and their receptors are good. But in order to, to give them the benefit of stability even more, wobble board is a fantastic technique by which you can just put them on a wobble board and see how they respond. And if they just buckle on that ankle very quickly, they just come back down again and start that 
self exercise for standing and developing that confidence usually we think if they pass the wobble board test then they are able to go back and play sports that is what generally we say okay prof uh, the other question was uh, regarding uh, suppose you have done it's an acute scenario that someone has quoted suppose it is a grade 3 ankle sprain you have diagnosed yeah how long do you immobilize normally so normally we immobilize for about 6 to 8 weeks the initial 6 weeks will be uh, and again we don't put a plaster cast on anymore we give the air cast boot which is a functional treatment so you put them in a in a in an air cast boot which can be taken off from time to time you can exercise you can put the boot back on again you can rest it ice it compress it and then at night time we take it off patients can do their active exercises but within their pain limitation so in other words no stretching beyond pain limitation because you don't want that to re injure again and complete avoidance of sports during that time you can do static exercise or dynamic exercise but patients by by done by the patient not by the physio there is no passive exercises at that point it is just done by the active patient exercises and that is more than enough yeah then another question is uh, what do you mean by high ankle sprain so the high ankle sprain as you know it's uh, because of the fibula fracture higher up than the ankle joint so it can start even at the neck of the fibula near the knee or come down into the shaft of the fibula <coughs> or even further down so that means you are uh, basically ever uh, doing an eversion injury of the ankle um there is a uh, dorsiflexion and eversion that leads to medial ligament tear the tibia rotates externally damaging the syndesmosis damaging the interosseous ligament or interosseous membrane and then the fracture comes out on the lateral side of the ankle into the fibula and that is known as high ankle sprain so you have a variety of that but the treatment usually is to get the length of the fibula back so you need to reduce the fibula back into normal position especially if it's a middle third lower third junction of the of the fibula generally if it's a proximal fibula or mid shaft fibula we don't fix it as you as you're aware but if it's middle third lower third or lower third then one has to fix the fibula using a plate and screws and in the acute setting i would use the screws to fix the syndesmosis there's been a paper published recently uh, which is a meta analysis of what is better whether suture button is better or whether um screws are better and in all honesty there's not much difference except the suture button there is slight early return to activity the screws as you know break most of the times the suture even if it breaks you don't see it and you can essentially ask the patients to wait bear immediately after the suture button is done so okay. in high ankle sprain you have to fix the fibula you have to fix the syndesmosis um okay prof there's another question for example if there is an anterior talofibular ligament injury yeah. and the uh, injury goes across the interosseous membrane higher above but yeah. there's no fracture that is clinically yeah. possible right it, uh, yes. it's a high ankle sprain indeed so how yeah. do we diagnose the interosseous membrane injury right so clinically when they come they will have pain around the ankle and when you examine the pain goes above the syndesmotic area as well the second test that one can do is the external rotation test like we discussed earlier on which can be positive squeeze test is positive and these are the patients who will uh, have pain and swelling proximally as well on one or two occasions with severe injuries like that in a professional player i have seen also compartment syndrome developing with these injuries 
So a high ankle sprain without fracture is yes, difficult to diagnose, and hence you need to have that high index of suspicion. But in addition to that, please remember that there could be incidence of compartment syndrome. Hey, Prof. Uh, I'll read out another question by one Dr. Bal Balaji from Chennai. Yeah. So he asks, what is the weight bearing protocol in conservative management? So like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, the six to eight weeks of boot immobilization is required. The first six weeks, although the patient is in a boot, they can walk partial to full weight bearing on it according to their pain tolerance. So if, they are, if they're managing their pain with uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, rest, elevation, ice, compression, then I'm happy for them to weight bear as much as they can tolerate. That means they could 50%, they may, may be 70%, they may be 100%. It entirely depends on the patient's perception. And this will go okay, on prof. for eight weeks. Okay, Prof. I think there are no more questions. Uh, and we have a lot of discussion and uh, there is very uh, lively discussion and so much of uh, topics have been covered. So thank you very much for your time. And... Uh, we look forward for more lectures. Your lectures have been greeted very well by our audience. They're okay. well received. I can see that a lot of people are sharing it on social media. And thank you, thank you once again for being with us, Dr. Limay. Thank you. Looking forward for another one. Indeed. Thank you. See you again. Thank you, Mr. Prof. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll end the meeting.